Welcome to Back to Earth. Like I said at the end of season eight, the show went on a nearly decade long hiatus before season nine, partly because they were working on a Red Dwarf movie, which never happened. That's all I'm gonna say about it, because honestly, I didn't get into Red Dwarf until long after that whole idea was scrapped. So while it's an interesting bit of trivia, I don't know what I would really say about it. But some of the ideas they had for it did end up in the show later, so I'll try to mention that stuff whenever it comes up. Anyway, back to... back to Earth. Like I said, it doesn't really address Season 8, but it does tell us that nine years have passed, so apparently the status quo was restored at some point during that time. It's just Lister, Rimmer, Crichton, and Cat on Red Dwarf, and Rimmer is a hologram in a blue uniform, as before Season 8. We open on Lister trying not to laugh about something. It's got to be in the middle, the middle, you metal moron. And then Rimmer. I'm sure most people hate the CG Scudder, but I kind of like how it's able to be so expressive. Scudders are pretty hard to screw up. They're pretty much always adorable. By the way, the placeholder for it was Danny John Jules's hand. Meanwhile, it's mentioned that Crichton is on vacation. Um, broom cupboard on VDAC. Yeah, Red Dwarf is so big that you can go on vacation without leaving the ship. 200 floors. It took me ages to get these. Anyway, Lister hates tomatoes, but is eating one because... I don't know why I put myself through it. He's allergic to them. So down to our last water tank, only G deck left. The ship being low on water is gonna come up again. How does eating tomatoes save water? It's good. I love it when it makes that squish sound, don't you? Yes, Lister really did all that to mess with Rimmer. Level. Level. It's never a fun time for the Scudders when Rimmer wants something done. Not level. I think that Scudder is crying. So Lister actually did have clothes to iron because he's getting dressed up for a special occasion, which is visiting a memorial of dead former crew members, one of which is Kachansky. Well, shit, this got dark. By the way, the picture of the guy on the left is actually the production designer for Red Dwarf 3 through 8, who died about seven years before. I thought I'd read you another book, Sense and Sensibility. Pray God, there's some car chases in this one. Anyway, Lister reads a Jane Austen book to Kachansky's picture, and it's really sweet and sad. Wait, Lister can't be crying that much. Wait, where the hell did Cat drop down from? The glass ceiling? What happened to you? You got a minute? Rimmer is reading Astro Navigation for Idiots. Anyway, poor Cat has been through an ordeal. You know that big tank on G-Deck? He means the water tank. Suddenly! He's so dramatic. This massive testicle shoots up out of the water and grabs me by the throat. He means tentacle. I hope so. Anyway, you can't blame him too much because he nearly got eaten by a giant sea monster of some kind. So where did it go? It didn't say, and it didn't leave a note. This is so weird. It's not that weird. How did it even hold a pen with its big testicle? He's right, that would be difficult. Meanwhile, Crichton's back from vacation. The sticker on his suitcase says, I heart the broom cupboard. I can't remember the last time I was so relaxed and utterly carefree. There's a big monster in the water tank. It's a disaster! Oh, my back! Oh, I'm one giant tension knot! I'd hate to see Crichton's reaction to that if he hadn't gone on that relaxing vacation. Anyway, Lister thinks they should kill the creature. We've got a fritter the critter. And Rimmer agrees. We're gonna need diving suits, bazookoids, mini grenades, laser lancer, and we're gonna need something good for me to read while you're all down there. Naturally. Well, I, I better start packing then. Oh, I already am packed. But Cat isn't having any of it. How would you like it if I flushed the entire ship supply of tuna out of an airlock? When we leaving? And don't wear nothing lilac or we'll clash. Don't worry, I don't think any of you will be wearing lilac again anytime soon, and most of us are fine with that. Anyway, they take a diving bell into the water tank. Hard as it is, I won't comment on what Cat is wearing, but I can comment on Crichton's little water wings. Really, Lister is the only one dressed sensibly, as usual. Anyway, they start hearing noises and... Uh, chaps, bit of an update. There appears to be something bigger than God heading straight for you. Well, do so! Get us out of here! Can't! Too scared. That's pretty bad, even for Rimmer. You just think about you, don't you? It's always you with you, isn't it? Anyway, whatever he thought he saw seems to be gone now. As you were. Oh my god. Turns out it was a giant squid, because now it's back. It's underneath us. Rimmer, pull us up. Slowly. Meanwhile, Rimmer's got music to listen to. 
Suddenly, testicles everywhere. Finally, Rimmer notices what's going on and gets them out of there. What these clowns do without me, eh? Delusional, thy name is Rimmer. Notice that they're all covered in blood and squid ink. And when Lister throws a severed tentacle at Rimmer, he gets covered in it too. That's kind of an important detail that's not going to pay off until the very end. You're supposed to be mine. This is so I love how there's an awkward silence here, and for like a second, you might think that Rimmer feels bad for nearly getting them killed. Is this about you again? But of course not. My heart is still hammering. I don't know how I got through that. I swear he's gonna be the death of them someday. Some kind of dimension migrating Leviathan. It's extraordinary. It's gone. So anyway, suddenly another hologram appears. My name is Katerina Bartikovsky. In past, I Red Dwarf Science Officer. And she's taking over Rimmer's job. No longer a hologram Arnold Rimmer, who is bit crap. Look, sir, confirmed. Yeah, that's not the last time they're gonna poke fun at the Psy scan. They mention here why Holly is offline. Lister left a bath running in the officers' quarters. We didn't find out about it for nearly nine years. The scutters still haven't finished drying him out. The real reason is because Norman Lovett had another falling out with the creators, so they just kind of did away with Holly indefinitely, and he hasn't been back as a regular since. I don't know why they didn't just bring back Hattie Hayridge, but whatever. A little later... How come there are two holograms active, both hard light? I thought the ship could only sustain one. How does Lister pass time? Yeah, she doesn't answer that. Hmm. He irons sneezes. Anyway, she blames Rimmer for Lister's laziness. What did I do? You're responsible for his life, but you do nothing. You think only of you. In my country, we have word for people like you. In my country, we have several. Hey, Lister's bike makes a return. I don't think we've seen that since season two. Anyway, Katerina seems to know of a way to get Lister back to Earth quickly. And then she's going to deactivate Rimmer. Then your hard drive will be fired into space, and when safe distance from ship, it will be detonated by nuclear fusion. You really don't like me, do you? Rimmer wants to discredit her, so later on he tells Crichton to dig up some dirt on her. You know what I'm talking about, kid? Ah, Ms. Bartikovsky. Yes, Miss Smagging Bartikovsky. Oh god, Rimmer, you're never going to learn, are you? Once again, Crichton keeps dropping hints, none of which Rimmer picks up on. What? what Good morning, Ms. Miss. As spoken, I bring Lister back to life, restore the drive, so can restart human race, yes? And how, pray tell, do you plan to do that? Well, the solution is staring you in your stupid, fat, ferrety face. Stupid, fat, ferrety face. So her plan is to somehow use the squid's dimension hopping ability to take them to the nearest alternate dimension where Earth is closer? Whatever. So Lister will travel to a new dimension, bring back a mate, and recreate human race. Anyway, after this cool looking montage, she has created a dimension hopping machine. It's working. Now, if calculations correct, Portal should, then now. I really dig the music in this scene, by the way. Anyway, it creates a portal that just starts sucking everything into it. Something is not right. Meanwhile, the computer tells her that their dimension doesn't exist, which she shrugs off as a glitch of some kind. Taking us to nearest valid reality. Make no sense. But she sends Rimmer as a guinea pig to make sure. That was a cool effect. Meanwhile, in the dimension they're about to go to, all of this is playing out on some TV sets at a department store. And yeah, this gets really meta. The next one to get sucked through is Lister. Then Crichton. And finally, Cat. Oh, yeah! Where are we, Crichton? Well, according to the size scans, we're in a department store in London in the early part of the 21st century. Red Dwarf. I don't really follow it myself. That size scan thing. Knows everything, doesn't it? Any bit of exposition. Yeah, this guy doesn't watch Red Dwarf, but he knows all about the size scan. Well, according to the size scan, sir, he's a pompous, know-all, know-nothing idiot called Mike Mellington. Who, incidentally, has a very small penis. This is a fun little jab at fans who take the show too seriously. I don't know if this is what inspired it or not, but it always reminds me of a story Ed Bai told, where he went to his first sci-fi convention and got recognized. He thought the guy was going to tell him how much he liked the show. Instead, he complained about the inconsistency with the time drive in season seven. You broke the rules of the time drive. It completely ruined my enjoyment of the series, and I've never watched Red Dwarf again. And that was the first thing that somebody said as I walked into the convention. 
Aww. How could anyone talk to Ed Bai like that? He is adorable and must be protected. Hey, Bugs! The portal's closed! We can't get back! I like how Kat said porthole instead of portal. I love the screens conveniently saying they're back. Is it me or is everyone staring? They used to have TV shows on Saturday nights where they'd get out all the freaks, make them sing and dance, and then point and laugh at them. As an American, that immediately makes me think of Saturday Night Live, though I'm sure they had some British show in mind. Now they're looking at DVDs. Back then, no one knew that the human race were utterly incapable of putting the DVDs back in their cases. Videos are just too big to lose. I love that they just explained why earlier episodes showed them using VHS tapes in the future. By the way, I love some of these DVDs on the shelf. Die screaming with sharp things in your head is a reference to demons and angels. Die screaming with sharp things in your head. There's also the cartoon that they were watching in Me Squared. I can't tell if the others are references or not, but I get a kick out of the covers of Space Cop Police Squad that shows a female cop wearing a uniform sporting a boob window. Sirs, look! Anyway, they finally notice what they conveniently missed when they first got there, that Red Dwarf is a TV show in this dimension. Wait, we're characters from a TV series who've somehow escaped the TV world into the real world. Just typical of my luck, isn't it? Just when things start to go right, it turns out that I'm... I'm not real. Rimmer is happy about this. This is too weird for words. Hey guys, look at this. I love that visual. People saying too weird for words is kind of a weird little running gag in this. So the Back to Earth DVD is now out yet, but Lister finds an empty case on display. In this universe, it takes place after season 10, which is weird, but I kind of like the idea that they acknowledge that some time has passed and plenty of things have happened off screen. Kachansky's dead. Notice Crichton's reaction to that. Knowing they will die in the final episode. Die? The dwarf is in best Blade Runner tradition. He's like the fuck is Blade Runner. Track down their creators to plead for more life and their metaphysical odyssey begins. All my life, I've wanted to go on a metaphysical odyssey. And this is the part that Kat is happy about. This isn't a terribly important conversation plot-wise, but it's hilarious. Lister just came back from the bathroom and there was no toilet paper, so he figures that people just hadn't started using it yet. Yeah, well, you've got to wash yourself in one of the sinks and use the air machine to dry your bum. And those air machines are really high. You're holding your cheeks apart, jumping up and down, trying to catch some breeze. Thanks for the mental image. Also notice how this display room is set up. They're basically doing a bunk scene. There's even a toy guitar. Anyway, Kat and Crichton were off trying to sell Crichton's head to get some money, but it didn't work out. So they root through some couches and find some, along with a bunch of other junk. I'm expecting to pull out Glenn Miller or Shergar any time. I like that Rimmer discreetly takes the condoms. But Kat leaves something behind. Some little gold origami thing. So now they're on their way to a sci-fi store. This is too weird for words. Oh, I want that little Starbug toy. And wow, there's some foreshadowing. Um, <clears throat> I just wondered if you could help us. We're, um, we're trying to find the guys involved in the making of a TV series called Red Dwarf. Anyway, they tell their story to the guy behind the counter, and he believes it. <laughs> Dimension Skid, was it? Happens a lot this time of year. Gotta be so careful. Turns out he knows a guy. El Presidente of the Red Dwarf fan club. Nothing that guy doesn't know about the small rouge one. Nice little Ace Rimmer quote there. Let's get this tea chest up into the stars and back to the small rouge one, eh? Bit of a fanatic. Changed his name to Reg Wolf. Got an H tattooed on his head. I love Rimmer's reaction to that. Like, who would want that? I've got, standing in my shop, the real, actual crew from Red Dwarf. They all kind of like being recognized now. Skin. Lister in yeah, particular. Uh, well, they're trying to find out how many shows they've got left. Exactly. Need some numbers, know you've got them. But that turned out to be a waste of time. Space Corps Directive 596. 596? Admit it, if you got to see Rimmer misquote a Space Corps Directive, you'd react the same way. Space Corps superchimps performing acts of indecency and zero gravity will lose all banana privileges. Cruise files over the eyes of the captain only. What's that? That's Dave Lister's bath from season nine. Best season ever, if you ask me. So much meta. Remember when Crichton ran in and told you that Kachansky had been sucked out of an airlock? There goes Crichton again. Yeah, it turns out that Lister only knew what happened to Kachansky because Crichton told him. Anyway, Rimmer finds some little prop. 
Crichton sees a name on it, which Lister remembers seeing somewhere. Crichton, scan the photo and beam it onto that TV. <laughs> the TV was showing that one scene from Polymorph. Uncrop. Uncrop. So yeah, here's a lengthy parody of that thing they do in crime dramas, you know the thing. It goes to seriously ridiculous levels, including zooming in on a drop of water to get its reflection. Zoom 260. Uh, sir, wouldn't it have been quicker to look him up in the phone book? Anyway, they now have the address of someone who might have some info. Now they just have to figure out how to get there. Hollyhop Drive. The guy behind the counter mentioned several things from previous episodes, but they all involve something that would be on Red Dwarf. Then there's this little gem. Beam there! Oh, that's Star Trek! That's not us, sir. No, no, we don't do that, sir. I love Crichton's reaction. Anyway, they end up taking the bus. Crichton is about as well disguised as the Trix rabbit. Meanwhile, Cat leaves behind another origami. From this angle, it's easier to tell it's a squid. Where's first class? It's all first class, mate. Good answer. Look, let's spit up so we don't look conspicuous, yeah? Anyway, Lister is looking at a magazine and comes across an article about the actress who played Kachansky. She's alive in this dimension, isn't she? You're Dave Lister, aren't you? What the hell? These kids aren't old enough to be watching Red Dwarf. What's it like having a whole TV channel named after you? I guess it is kind of funny that Red Dwarf is on BBC Dave. Even though you're disgusting, sometimes you're quite brave. Yeah, that's Lister in a nutshell. Are you sad about Kachansky? Anyway, these kids don't think that Kachansky is really dead. You're a mess, falling apart. Drinking. Being daft. So she took a blue midget and liked it. Why would Crichton lie to me? He was only trying to save your feelings. That would mean she was still alive. So yeah, they've given Lister something to hope for. Tell Rimmery to smeg it! Later they get off the bus and... Oh, there's Katerina. Erase me? I thought it was murder to kill a hologram. Morally, ethically, hologram killing fine. And this is amazing. Fair enough. <gasps> Go Rimmer. Come on, we haven't got all day. She didn't see that coming, did she? I did. We all did, Criters. Man, this is too weird for words. Maker of latex masks for the TV industry, specializing in noses. Didn't know I could read Chinese. Anyway, they track down the guy who makes noses in a lab? Pretty sure this is a Blade Runner reference. Anyway, he's also wearing Kat's fur coat from earlier, and Kat's not happy about it. I still many things so on eBay. How many episodes have we got left? Is it true we're going to die? I don't know that stuff. Who don't know? I don't know when Cat became the muscle of the group, but I kind of like it. Big Boss! He know everything! Anyway, it turns out that he stole a car from the Red Dwarf fan club president. You want to borrow? I love that little Starbug keychain. That's nothing, though. You can't be serious. So, uh, there's Carbug. I love the look on Lister's face, like, the absurdity of the situation is not lost on him. This is another tune I like. It's very upbeat and just fits the mood. Apparently the scene was horrible to film. The car is so small they had to remove the seats to fit all four of them in there. So Craig and Danny are sitting on crates while Robert and Chris crouch behind them. Sorry about my language. And poor Danny kept messing up his lines. I'm sorry, one more. Cabin crew, prepare for landing. I love how they're acting like they're landing the real Starbug. Handbrake engaging. Well done, everyone. Pretty sure those smiles are genuine. They were so glad to be done filming in that car. So they're looking for Craig Charles now, and apparently they're on the set of his other show, which I've never watched. This is just like where I grew up, except there's less burning cars. Anyway, Crichton starts talking to a mailbox. Perhaps it's overheated. And someone spots them. Let me do the talking, sir. I've been studying the dialect. Hiya, Chuck, pal, love, sir. Took me a little while to figure out that they're making fun of British slang. What a load of numpties. Get your kecks on, lads. We're sorted. Quality. Mint. I was like, what language is this? Good job, chaps. We were so authentic, it was frightening. So anyway, the guy who saw them earlier turns out to be a friend of Craig Charles, or maybe he's on the show with him, I don't know, and I don't care. So he tells them all about it. Even you were there. I was there. How many have you had? Well, I've had a couple, but listen, I've just seen you. And here they come. Hi, guys. We really need your help. There's a mind fuck. You're the only one that can help us, man. I've heard about these. 
or flashbacks. You see, sir, we're from an alternate dimension, and we need answers. It turns out that there is one more episode of Red Dwarf left in the series before they get killed off, and the show ends, and they're currently in that episode. There's another origami squid. We've got to speak to our creator. And I've got to get back to the Priory. The guy's a wreck and pretends to be somebody else all day. That's no way to make a living, smeg it. Take that, me. <laughs> so they make their way to the home of the creator of Red Dwarf. <laughs> Hey, this must be that Grant Naylor guy I've heard so much about. It's a joke, stop the angry typing. And wow, he's, um, organized. Oh god, it's the mini Rimmers from the Rimmer experience. Visitors, sir. And they're terrifying. We want more life, Smegger. A series cancellation sequence can't be revised once it's established. Tell that to Futurama. I grew weary of you. Aww. You have all burned so very, very brightly, and for so very, very long. Just like the Red Dwarf Star itself. Nothing lasts forever. So they're getting kind of desperate now, and they start making suggestions for shows that their characters could continue to be in. What about a show about cats? That I'd never wear. Yeah, who would want to watch cats? Your deaths will be magnificent, sad, and beautiful. Are we talking about the same show? Actually, I have some theories about that that I'll talk about in the end. The shooting script. So he tells them about their death scene where he essentially chases them down and shoots them with lots of shattering glass. That must have been fun to film. Not much margin for error. Rimmer really should have disappeared leaving just the light be, though. Then again, this is in the writer's head. Maybe he thought it was more dramatic this way. Sad and beautiful. Gentlemen, time to... Die. Wow, go cat. Anyway, now they want to force him to write a better ending, especially Rimmer. I get a girlfriend who's gorgeous and crazy about me. And before you even think of it, after we've bonked each other senseless, she doesn't turn out to be my long lost sister. I feel like that was somewhat inspired by what happened to him in Only the Good. But I'm your sister. How did you know I was thinking that? Because I know how you think. But the creator still has the upper hand. You can never win. Accept it and die well. Lister is done with this shit. If you tell me you moron, you cease to exist! Been dead for ages, man. I was never alone. I just didn't realize it. Now I want more life! I'm not sure how that killed him, but okay. And yet, they still exist. How can I kill him? That's not me. I don't kill people. You killed him because he made you kill him, sir. It turns out that the scene where he shoots them wasn't really part of the script. He killed us by getting us to kill him. There's a great outtake of this scene because nearly everyone stays in character after the flub. We killed him by killing ourselves. That's not quite right. I knew I wouldn't get that line right, sir. But you did very well, did. Even Danny, and he almost never does. I didn't know the difference. I thought you were doing good. There's no one to keep us alive. He's right. In fact, I don't think I'll feel too well. Uh, Mr. Stark? Anyway, rather than looking at the script to see how it's supposed to end, Lister rips out those pages and burns them so they can write their own ending. Of course. What's written happens. As long as we've got this, we control the world. We can do whatever we want. So Lister starts playing with it. So the rest of our loaves can be one giant hedonistic wash fulfillment. Typos. Sorry, guys. You really think you could write your wee out of this? Hey, witch me, baby. Just witch me. <gasps> you get to hop me stupid, sir. Hop me stupid. Wasn't this a Futurama episode? Now I am leaving Earth for no reason! Anyway, after Lister is done making everyone do silly things... All right. Next step. Happy ending. It turns out he wasn't in control after all. Or maybe it's not the typewriter that's controlling our world. Maybe it's something else. As Crichton says that, Cat has made another origami squid, and he finally wonders why he's been doing it. There's something inside. Blow. Are you ready for this twist? It looks like a squid. That's something else that controls the world. How about it's our combined subconscious? Like the time we were ambushed by the despair squid? This entire three-part series has been a giant callback to Back to Reality, including the title. Are you saying the creature in the water tank, the one that inked us, was another despair squid? Because I don't feel despair. 
They hear footsteps from the other room, and Kat identifies it as Kachansky. And again, there goes Crichton. I can get her back again. But in the real world, sir, you'll be dying. Th this isn't real. It'll feel real. Not in your heart. This is the only chance I've got of getting her back again. Okay, Crichton, time to spill it. Miss Kachansky's not dead, sir. Those kids were right. I, I was trying to protect you. Now Lister has to choose between a reality that may or may not have Kachansky in it, or this pretend world where she is close by and will love him unconditionally. As the rest of them disappear as they come out of the hallucination, Lister decides to stay. So yes, everything that happened since right after they got out of the tank was a hallucination. Our natural defenses fought back. Our previous encounter with the creature must have strengthened our antibodies, which gave us the option to choose between realities. Speaking of... It seems you're undecided about which reality you wish to live in. I'm, I'm mulling it over. In your dreams, did you kiss me? I never wanted to wake up. Then don't. Yeah, he's definitely gonna stay. But then... I have to leave and get you back. You'll never get me. I'm way out of your league. I'm pretty cool. I don't take any smeg. And even though I'm disgusting, sometimes I can be quite brave. Despite being a one-episode hallucination, Kachansky is still better written than she was in most of season eight. So yeah, Lister has decided to wake up and go back home. A little later, Crichton figures out what kind of squid they were dealing with. Well, analysis of the creatures are suggest it's a female. Turns out the male's ink causes despair, but the female's is the opposite and causes elation. What kind of crazy defense mechanism is that? Well, it's an ingenious one, sir, because it means you stop attacking it. So how did she get on board the ship? I kind of brought her. Cat. Years ago, from that ocean planet, I'm gonna eat you little fishy, cause I like little fish. Then she escaped. Boy, has she grown. Literally, this whole thing was his fault. Rather than killing this squid like they did with the male one, they decide to let her go. I'm thinking we drop her off at the nearest ocean moon. Make some happy sea life. Yeah, I can see how they'd be a lot less mad at this one. She didn't cause them to nearly commit suicide. What's gonna happen to everybody in the reality we left? Well, they'll continue to exist as a consequence of us creating them in our hallucination sir. But those sad suckers will live out the rest of their lives convinced they're the real ones and we're characters from a TV show. Zing. <laughs> And so ends Back to Earth. Uh, unpopular opinion maybe, but I love Back to Earth. Of course, I could be a bit biased, since these were the first episodes I watched in their entirety and basically solidified my interest in this show. As I mentioned in Sirens, before I got into Red Dwarf myself, I saw bits and pieces of it while my husband was watching it. As it turns out, and by sheer luck, I'd seen most of Back to Reality, so despite not quite being a Red Dwarf fan yet when I first saw Back to Earth, I still understood the twist at the end and thought it was pretty brilliant. What it comes down to is that Back to Earth is probably the closest we'll ever get to a Red Dwarf movie. If you put all three episodes together, it's about an hour and ten minutes. Okay, that's very short for a movie, but it's not unheard of. And it just has a very cinematic feel. Despite the tight budget it had, the effects were pretty damn good, at least for Red Dwarf standards, and it's just visually impressive overall. I also liked a lot of the jokes, even the pop culture stuff, like humans being physically incapable of putting CDs away. And I like the jab at fans who are overly critical. That's easy to understand just from being a member of other fandoms. And the whole bit about Lister using the bathroom, I loved all of that. Also Carbug, that was fun. It also handles drama really well. And can we talk about Craig Charles' acting in this? I mean, he cries in one scene, and he goes from looking absolutely miserable to melancholy to hopeful to amused. I'm just super impressed at how much range he shows in this and how believable it is. The only criticisms I can think of is that the first episode moves kind of slowly and some of the jokes can run on a little too long, but that's about it. I guess Katarina is a good character as card-carrying villains go, but my favorite part is seeing the outtakes. Like, the actress is super apologetic when she messes up a line and it's hilarious. I'm sorry, I hate myself. We'll bring Lister back to life. 
<clears throat> Everything's fine. Don't worry. I also like how she grabs Chris Berry by the arm and walks him back every time. <laughs> I can't really criticize since I'd probably grab Chris Berry every time I got a chance to, but it's still funny. One thing that tickles me is that a lot of what they describe in the season that happened off screen and how the creator talks doesn't really sound like the Red Dwarf we know. It comes across more like a sci-fi drama than a sci-fi comedy. I mean, the idea of anyone dying a beautiful and tragic death on this show is just... That just doesn't happen on Red Dwarf. So for a while I kind of theorized that the dimension shown in Back to Earth isn't our dimension, and the Red Dwarf they talk about was an entirely different kind of show. But again, they do make references to our Red Dwarf, like Rimmer getting Space Corps directives wrong, and they mention the running gag in the series about Rimmer's blow-up doll. Not to mention that they literally show a clip from Polymorph. So the theory that Red Dwarf is different in this dimension doesn't quite work. Maybe the fictional Season 9 talked about is an odd duck and more dramatic than usual. Of course it's a moot point since all of that ends up being a hallucination anyway, but it's still kind of fun to theorize, even if it's all hypothetical. Of course there are some things I missed. After watching the Making Of documentary, I am aware that there are cameos from well-known British actors. But since I don't watch much British TV, that's kind of lost on me. Fortunately they aren't all nudge nudge wink wink about it, so it's not a distraction or anything. You either catch it or you don't, no biggie. Another thing is, um, believe it or not, I'd never seen Blade Runner. <laughs> Though they do manage to throw in a couple of mentions of Blade Runner, so anyone who hasn't seen the movie could kind of mentally fill in the gaps. Oh, the seemingly random thing must be a Blade Runner reference, okay. So again, not really a distraction for me. But it didn't seem right to make this video without having seen Blade Runner, but I wanted to focus on the references to earlier Red Dwarf episodes, so I kind of split the difference and watched Blade Runner before getting to this recap. So Blade Runner involves a synthetic human asking his creator for more life with similar dialogue, and it ends up with the creator being killed, though it's a bit more gory. There's a guy named Chu who creates eyes, in his shop called Eye World. There's also an interrogation where his coat gets taken away, exposing him to the cold, again with similar dialogue. There's a chase scene through Chinatown that ends with the victim being shot and falling through several huge panes of glass. Red Dwarf didn't actually exaggerate that as much as I assumed. There's a scene where Harrison Ford's character does the whole zoom and enhance thing. Not quite as insane as in Red Dwarf, though it does involve getting an image from a reflection. He also finds a clue in a bathtub that looks like a scale, and it turns out that it was synthetic and had a microscopic serial number on it. There's also a well-dressed man who has a habit of making origami figures and leaving them behind. Other than that, both looks sported by Kachansky are based on how Sean Young's character looks. Now I know where that awful hairstyle came from. And Crichton's disguise has glasses with big octagon-shaped lenses like the creator in Blade Runner. There's also a guy who makes little robots, which I'm pretty sure the little Rimmers are referencing. Huh. <sighs> I seem to recall SF Debris saying that Back to Earth would be confusing or distracting to anyone who hadn't seen Blade Runner, and for anyone who had seen it, it'd be too repetitive. Well, like I said, as far as my own experience, I disagree with the first point. I didn't mind not getting those references. As for the second, well, I'll never be able to experience seeing Blade Runner before Back to Earth, so I can't really say if I would have had a bad reaction to it, but I can kind of see how that'd be an issue. I guess that's about all I have to say about Back to Earth. Again, I might be biased since it was basically my gateway drug to Red Dwarf, so I pretty much have to like it if only for that. And again, I wasn't familiar enough with Blade Runner to be bothered by how they handled the references. Either way, I love it. And hopefully this will be the last multi-part Red Dwarf episode I'll have to cover. <laughs> Next up is Season 10 with Trojan. See you then. But it's essential that we keep all this in perspective. We're not real! What are we gonna do? There, I think that's pretty much put it in perspective, don't you, sir? 